Genesis 45. Genesis 45. Again, reading in verse uh, 16. Just to get the whole story here. This is in the middle of that great drama uh, story of uh, Joseph. Um, yes, Joseph from Jacob and his dysfunctional family. And Lord knows it was. <laughs> What a mess it was, but as great a drama as you'll ever find anywhere in history or anywhere in literature. Amen. That's right. It's the story of Joseph and his brothers, and it's just unbelievable. And we don't have time to go into the whole story, but you know shortly how that uh, Joseph was the favorite of his father, and his brothers hated him, and they threw him in a pit and sold him to some merchants to the crew, and he ended up in Egypt in a big mess. And his brothers wouldn't listen when he was crying for mercy and trying to get him to get him out. And they went and lied to his daddy and claimed that he had killed. And his daddy's heart was broken and stayed broken for years. And Joseph was very unfortunately there under masters and then got in trouble and got lied on and got thrown in jail. And then, but no matter where he went, he rose to the top. That's right. When the hand of God is on you, it doesn't matter if you're in slavery. You'll have better slavery than most free men will ever have with millions of dollars. He got thrown in jail. He was at the top of the jail. Pharaoh found out he could interpret dreams by the help of God, and next thing you know, he was at the top of the Egyptian government. I mean, there was just no keeping him down. God was all over him. There's no doubt about it. But in this passage, his brothers, Come back, needing help from him. I can't tell you how many times people have been hurtful to God's people. And the Lord worked it around for the very people that had been nasty, starry pieces of trash to God's people. All of a sudden, we're having to come back to them for help. Amen. It happens routinely, over and over again. You know what that does? That reminds people that it's God's people that you better side with. And it happens over and over again. Sure enough, they go back to Joseph because they're starving to death. And lo and behold, Joseph is the one that can help them. But they don't even know it's Joseph. So Joseph makes himself known to his brothers. Genesis chapter 45, verse 16, the Bible says, And the fame thereof was heard in Pharaoh's house, saying, Joseph's brethren are come, and it pleased Pharaoh well and his servants. By the way, Ethan, did we get this little button on this thing? I didn't even yes, know. Thank you, brother. And Pharaoh said unto Joseph, Say unto thy brethren, This do ye, lay your beast, and go get you unto the land of Canaan, and take your father and your households, and come unto me, and I'll give you the good of the land of Egypt, and ye shall eat the fat of the land. Now thou art commanded, This do ye, take ye wagons out of the land of Egypt for your little ones and for your wives, and bring your father, and come. Also, regard not your stuff, for the good of all the land of Egypt is yours. Oh, so many blessings from this. You know how many people won't come to God and enjoy his blessings because they're busy holding on to their pork, tattered rags. Oh, that's good. Hey, man, let your rags go. The good of all the land of Egypt is yours, and God's offering to give it to you free. Quit hesitating, holding on to your tattered rags, and come get his beautiful robes that he's offering to you. There's so many. There is no end to the sermons in the Bible lessons about these stories well, that's true. in the Old Testament. Verse 21, And the children of Israel did so. And Joseph gave them wagons according to the commandment of Pharaoh and gave them provision for the way. I'm talking about he had to give them wagons for all the stuff they were taking to go pick up their family and come back to Egypt. To all of them he gave each man changes of raiment. But to Benjamin, he gave 300 pieces of silver and five changes of raiment. And to his father he sent after this manner 10 asses laden with the good things of Egypt and 10 she asses laden with corn and bread and meat for his father by the way. So he sent his brethren away and they departed and he said unto them, See that ye fall not out by the way. They went up out of Egypt and came into the land of Canaan unto Jacob their father and told him, saying, Joseph is yet alive, and he is governor over all the land of Egypt. And Jacob's heart fainted, for he believed them not. They told him all the words of Joseph which he had said unto them, and when he saw the wagons which Joseph had sent to carry him, the spirit of Jacob their father revived. Jacob, uh, Jacob always walked by sight. 
He, he just had a problem with that. He, he just didn't have the faith that he should have had. He always thought he needed to scheme and figure it out himself. And as long as his sons were telling him, Joseph is yet alive, and they were all confirming the story, he still didn't believe it. But when he saw them wagons, <laughs> boy, he believed it then. <laughs> he just, you had to convince him. You had to prove it. Verse 28, and Israel said, it is enough. Joseph, my son, is yet alive. I will go and see him before I die. I want to preach this evening on fall not out, by the way. Dear Heavenly Father, I pray that you'll take these truths and sink them down into our ears and minds and hearts and change us as we recognize the unbelievable works that you do. Now, Lord, I'm talking to some people that are good Bible-believing Baptists and they're in the way of your blessing and the way of your service, and I appreciate that. Lord, you can really get tired in the way. And Joseph is warning his brothers and telling them to warn his father, here's some stuff to take care of you. Don't fall out on the way. Lord, I want to preach to some Baptists tonight, including myself. Let's see that we don't fall out, by the way. With all the blessings that's been given us and all the things we can help some other people with, I pray we stay in the way. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. All right, now it's a real good study to study in the Bible, the way, the way. One of my favorites is in Psalm 119, verses 30 and 31 and 32. He says, I have chosen the way of truth. Thy judgments have I laid before me. I have chosen the way. The next verse says, I have stuck unto thy testimonies, O Lord. Put me not to shame. I have chosen, I have stuck. The last verse there in this little passage says, I will run the way of thy commandments. When thou shalt enlarge my heart. I have chosen, I have stuck, I will run. Let me tell you what we do a lot. We choose the way, and we stick with it a while, and then we quit. Well, now, I did that for a long time, but I'm tired now. No, it ends with I will run. I remember Dr. Ruckman was getting on up in his 70s, and I thought, surely, he'll start slowing down. He did not slow. He put the pedal to the metal. He kept turning out works. He kept preaching. He kept writing books. He kept showing up in jails all across America preaching. He had literally hundreds of converts in his 70s and 80s. It was unbelievable how he kept doing. I have chosen. I have stuck. I will run. You know what you want to do at the last? You want to sprint to the finish line. Amen. You do not want to say, all right, well, I did real good years ago, but now I'm coasting all in. No, you sprint to the finish line. That's, a, that's one good lesson about the way. In the way, you see the light from heaven. You know what Paul said when he was telling about his conversion experience? He says in Acts 26, 13, I saw in the way a light from heaven. You know why some of you aren't seeing some light? You know why some of you can't figure out which way to go? You're not in the way. You might have turned that dumb little electronic screen off for a little while and get the yeah. Bible out. Walk out in nature and meditate and pray, and if you'll get in the way, you'll start seeing some light. I bet you you ain't going to see much light in these world's pictures. I bet you ain't going to see much light in this world's philosophy. I bet you ain't going to see much light hanging around the wrong crowd. I bet you ain't going to see much light dressing and acting and smelling and looking and thinking and stinking and everything else like this world does. You're going to have to get in the way. And when you do, all of a sudden all these lights come on. Everybody's looking for lights and not sure why God won't help them. Let me give you a, a real big piece of that puzzle. Get in the way. And if you're in the way, you ain't in the world. The world and the way are opposite. If you like the stuff the world likes, you ain't in the way and you don't have any light. And if you hate the world and its stuff, I don't mean you hate the individuals and we love their souls, but I mean you hate them and their thoughts and their philosophies and their junk. Then you get in the way, then all of a sudden all the lights come on. That is exactly what's missing. And Christians understood that so much, even in my life yes. when I was a little boy. Nowadays, people are just lost, trying to be just like the world and wondering why God's light is not on for them. It was in the way that he saw a great light from heaven. Uh, in the way, you'll find God's leading. The famous passage when the ser uh, servant of Abraham was going to get uh, Isaac a bride, was going to get Isaac a bride, Young people looking to get married, let me tell you what to do. Get in the way. You get married to the wrong one, you in trouble. You better find you one in the way. Don't you get one out there in the world. Lord, help you. You 
talk about misery. You talk about can't stand each other. You talk about can't get along for any length of time at all. You talk about miserable while you're in the relationship and can't wait to break up the relationship. You get in this world's relationship. But while the servant was going to get a bride for Isaac, is what he said. He said, I being in the way, the Lord led me. Yes. But if you want to find a bride, get in the way. You want to find a husband, get in the way. All right, here's the most important one is fellowship with Jesus. Remember when those two disciples were walking on the road to Emmaus? You know what they said? They said, did not our heart burn within us while he talked with us by the way and opened to us the scriptures? Is the Lord not talking to you or the scriptures not being opened to you to help you in the decisions you've got to make in your life? I bet I know what the problem is. You ain't in the way. When you're in the way, Jesus talks to you and opens the scriptures. If that seems like darkness, if that seems like a, a brass above your head and iron underneath your feet and you can't get out of it, you're not in the way. That ain't the way it is in the way. In the way, the lights come on. In the way, you get the leadership of the Lord. In the way, you get the fellowship of Jesus. Get in the way. And then in Hebrews chapter 5, the Bible says, Who can have compassion on them that are out of the way? You know what us Christians know? We know about times that we got out of the way. And the Lord wasn't there. And oh, yeah. Life was frustrating and nothing was getting done. So we can look over at lost people and rather than being self-righteous and judging them, we can feel sorry for them. We remember being there. You know what will make you a better witness? When you have a heart for people. You know what will make you an ineffective witness? And you couldn't care. I've got to figure it out. You couldn't care less. I've got to figure it out. I'll be fine. I don't know what their problem is. Uh, same problem you used to have. You ought to have some more understanding. All right, so that's in the way. Now let's talk about this in this actual passage here. Genesis chapter 45. Joseph warns his brethren not to fall out on their journey. Now they've just been blessed. I mean, they're going to come in there and be with the guy that is next unto Pharaoh. Then he's going to make sure they have plenty to eat. He's going to make sure they're taken care of, protected. Their life just got a whole lot better, but before it does, they got to go all the way down there in this wilderness in a time of famine, get their daddy and what other kinfolk and servants they have down there and bring them all back in a time of famine. Now, don't misunderstand. they got wagons full of supplies. They'll be okay, except those wagons are kind of heavy. The horses and the mules and the donkeys are going to get tired of pulling that. And there's a lot of work to this. There, there's some trouble ahead of you. Let me tell you about you Christians. You got, you're, you got it made. I mean, your retirement is out of this world, <laughs> as they say. Yeah. But there are going to be some hard times where you're going to get a little tired carrying those heavy wagons, even though they're full of good things. And you're, you're in danger of falling out. See that you fall not out, by the way. How many know some Christians that have fallen out? Oh, yeah. You've been saved for very long. You know some that was in church. They loved the Lord. They sang a special. They taught a class. They preached a sermon. And now, who knows where they are? Pastor Bill used to joke and say the, the IRS couldn't find them. <laughs> They're gone. You know what happened? They fell out. You know why? It gets tiring. The reason the New Testament says, be not weary in well-doing. For in due season, we shall reap if we faint not. Now, I'm going to say, tell you tonight, fall not out, by the way. Because you've been laden with some good things spiritually. And you have a message to convey, just like they did to their father. So it's imperative that you fall not out, by the way. Now, there's three things that you very likely may fall out due to. Number one is, don't fall out by quarrel. Don't fall out by quarrel. We won't turn to all the passages in this story for sake of time, but let me tell you about Jacob and his family. <laughs> they stayed in a fight. Jacob and Esau fought, and then there was tension between them. His wives, you know, he had multiple wives in this, uh, in this culture, and they stayed in a fight and tension between them, and the brothers fought, and the ones that were sons of one mother, you know, didn't weren't as close to the ones that were sons of the other mother, and they definitely hated Joseph because he was the favorite of the father. and uh, oh, He knew they were like to fight and to have a falling out. 
Anybody know any Baptists that had any thought of that? <laughs> Ever heard of a Baptist church split? Not me. Just kidding. I mean, all day, every day, man. See that you fall not out by the way. Quarrel with family members. You know what will mess you up? Deciding you're not going to get along with family Deciding you're just going to get bitter towards them and hold on and not let go. Our families are falling apart. It is the cool thing for what they call therapists these days. Everybody believes that therapists. And the one main thing they definitely tell you is your family is a problem. <laughs> you need to get away from your overbearing mama. You need to get away from your abusive daddy. And I know that there are some cases of it, but it is strange how nearly every case that ever goes to a therapist is told that, oh, yeah, they did you wrong. You such a victim, blah, 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 blah. And you know what they do? They split families. Exactly what they do. And they do it over and over and over and over again. Now, you know what will happen? You'll get in a, in a problem with your family, and you'll get bitter, and you ain't ready to do nothing right because you're just too mad, busy being mad at your family. Well, it's the very thing that God Almighty set up to be a blessing and a help and a strength. Quarrel with family members. You know what this family did? Man, they quarreled. By the way, it ain't all on the therapist. Long before therapists ever showed up, families couldn't stand each other. They get sibling rivalry and they get all kinds of other things. But boy, we got more and more of it, strengthening even more and more. You can't find people happy with their relationships in our day. I don't have time to get into all the studies on that, but good night. It's ridiculous. We can't get along with anybody. We are so in our own little cocoons, looking at what we want to look at and listen to what we want to listen to and reading what we're interested in and how our little group is right, we can't stand anybody around us. It's unreal. Quarrel with family members. Here's a good one. Quarrel with other Christians. I can't tell you all the Christians that quit on God because they got mad at some of them. Oh, yeah. If it be possible, as much as lies in you, live peaceably with all men. As we have therefore opportunity, let us do good unto all men, especially to them who are of the household of faith. Galatians 6 10. Amen. Just decide you're not going to fight with them. I have heard lost people many times say, hey, I am not going to have trouble with my neighbor. If it's going to cause the neighbors to get mad, I'm getting rid of the dog. I'm doing whatever. It is not worth it to have trouble with my neighbors. I've heard even lost people have that wisdom. Why is it that many people can't understand that? You don't want to have a quarrel with your neighbors. You don't want to have a quarrel with your co-workers. You don't want to have a quarrel with your family. You don't want to have a quarrel with your um, fellow church members. You don't want to have quarrels in all of these areas. You know why? It's going to be miserable to try to live that way. Amen. Quarrel with family members, quarrel with other Christians. But here's the deal. Don't fall out. Just quarrel with God. You know where the problem comes? The Lord allowed something to happen. And you're mad at him for it. And you can't forgive him for it. And I can do case after case. Somebody's marriage didn't last. They're mad at God. Somebody's loved one died. They're mad at God. Somebody's ministry was going and crashed due to sin and somebody running their mouth, they're mad at God. I heard not long ago about another preacher been in the ministry for decades. And called up the preacher friend and said, I'm out. I quit. I ain't got no more. The preacher said, Well, we'll just be sure, sir. I understand. So you mean to tell me if I needed you to fill my pulpit, I've known you for 30, 40 years, whatever it was, and you've preached and always done a great job. I need you to come to church. You will not do it. He said, That's right. I'm done. I quit. I've had enough to the brother. And I, that guy had probably been involved in a church split and some things, and people said some bad things and hurt his feelings, and he just was done. And he, and he was mad at some other Christians, but mainly he was mad at God for allowing it to happen. And that's who, that's who we're ultimately mad at. Let's be honest. If there's a problem in the family, who could have stopped it but allowed it to go on? God. If there's a problem with other Christians, who could have stopped it but allowed it to go on? God. That's where you're coming. Elijah, you know what Elijah did when the Lord didn't let things happen the way he wanted them to happen? He said, all right, let's go ahead and kill them. I'm not as good as 
my predecessor that came before me that was with me. They're very, it would be a real short list that wasn't upon the level of Elijah. The Lord thinks so much of Elijah, he has him come back at the Mount of Transfiguration and talk to Jesus. He thought so much of Elijah, he's going to have him come back in the tribulation period. So Elijah's way up high on the list, okay? How many people do you know get to live one time, and you hear stories about him throughout the Word of God, comes back during the life of Jesus, and comes back during the tribulation period? He's on the short list of some of the greats, I'll guarantee you. And yet he said, well, I'm not as good as my father, you know. <laughs> Just go ahead and kill me now, Lord, I've had enough. What happened? Lord didn't allow things to happen the way he wanted to. <laughs> I got a little dose of that. I'm not going to oh, lie. Oh, yes. Jeremiah, I'm not going to preach in his name anymore. Jonah. Lord, isn't this what I told you would happen? I knew you were a merciful God. You'd have mercy on those men of ice that killed a bunch of my countrymen. Maybe you were going to stand them. And he got mad. And the Lord said, are you doing good to be angry? He said, yes, even unto death. You know, when you get real angry, you get a little bit unreasonable like that. Oh, yeah. Don't ask me how I know. <laughs> Nobody can reason with you. And even when they say, now, is that really a good position? Yeah, I'm sure I'm right. <laughs> Prophet of God will get that way. You know what happens when you get that way? You fall out. You better stop. You better consider. Don't fall out by quarrel. Number two, don't fall out for lack of understanding. Matthew chapter 13. It's a great passage. Famous passage. The parable of the sower. Oh, Jesus said this is the most, in some ways, the most important of all the parables. Matthew chapter uh, 13, verse 3, it says, And he spake many things unto them in parables, saying, Behold, the sower went forth to sow, and when he sowed, some seeds fell by the wayside, and the fowls came and devoured them up. The first type of seed that he talks about is that wayside seed, the seed that falls by the wayside. And when he interprets it a few verses later, look down at verse 19 and look what he says happens there. When anyone heareth the word of the kingdom and, look at it, understandeth it not, then cometh the wicked one and catcheth away that which was sown in his heart. This is he which receives seed by the wayside. You know what will make you fall out? You don't have any understanding. You know what will give you understanding? The Word of God. The entrance of thy word giveth light. It giveth understanding unto the simple. You know why we have a generation of Christians that doesn't have the understanding we've had in so many generations past? Here's why. Because they're not having that Word of God in them. The entrance of thy word giveth light. Remember when we said earlier that you get in the way, all of a sudden you get light? When you get in the Word, all of a sudden you get light. Yes. Somebody doesn't have any light and they make bad decision after bad decision after bad decision. A lot of times it's because they're not in the Word. God's Word gives understanding. Here's another one. Departure from evil gives understanding. Romans chapter 3. Romans chapter 3 is a great passage and an important passage to us in the church age. Let me get over there so I'll be sure and word this right and don't mess it up. Let's see, Romans 3, I think I want verse 11. Is that what I'm after here? Romans 3, 11. There is none that understandeth. There is none that seeketh after God. They are all gone out of the way. There's that way. They are together become unprofitable. Unprofitable. Similar to our term, ain't no account. That's right. Good for nothing. That's right. Unprofitable. You're wasting your time with it. When somebody doesn't have understanding, they're not seeking after God. Job 28, 28 says it this way. The fear of the Lord, that is wisdom, and to depart from evil is understanding. You want to be sure you don't fall out of the way? Get some understanding. You know how that will come? God's word and departure from evil. You've been over here living like the world. You've been over here pleasing the flesh. You've been over here getting involved in some of the funny, curious art, witchcraft and stuff for the devil. Get out of that and depart from evil. And all of a sudden, some understanding can come to you. And the lights get turned off. As long as you keep going that way, there won't be any light. God doesn't give light over there. His light's over here. Amen. If you want light, you've got to go where the light shines. Departure from evil gives understanding. I'll give you another one. Hearing reproof. 
gives understanding. Proverbs chapter 15. Proverbs chapter 15, a great verse on these things. Verse 31, the ear that heareth the reproof of life abideth among the wise. Reproof is where somebody fusses at you. Listen when somebody fusses at you. It might be your parents. It might be your husband. It might be your wife. It might be your brother. It might be your co-worker. It might be a friend or a neighbor. It doesn't mean that you know, they're human. So it doesn't mean that everything they're saying is right. But it's worth listening to. They may have a point. You're not perfect. Verse 32 says, He that refuseth instruction despiseth his own soul. Amen. But he that heareth reproof getteth understanding. Again, I'm not saying they're always right. There will be times they'll give you something you think you did wrong. You'll look, you got a scripture for it, and you were right. Don't worry about it, but don't stop listening to reproof either. He that heareth reproof getteth understanding. Don't fall out by quarrel. Don't fall out for lack of understanding, all right? And I'll give you one more, and I, I do hate to talk about this one more than this. Don't fall out due to God's chastening. Now, here's what's going to happen. You're not perfect. You are going to mess up. Even with a good heart, deciding you're not going to quarrel, having some understanding, you're still imperfect. You're still a sinner. And God's going to see you step out of the way, and he's going to give you a little spanking. He's going to give you some correction. And that right there is where some people get out. That's right. That's right there is where some people get out of the way. All right, now the famous passage on this is over in Hebrews chapter 12. Yeah. Hebrews chapter 12, And ye have forgotten the exhortation which speaketh unto you as unto children. My son, despise not thou the chastening of the Lord, nor faint when thou art rebuked of him. For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. If ye endure chastening, God dealeth with you as with sons. For what son is he whom the Father chasteneth not? Look at verse 9. Furthermore, we have had fathers of our flesh which corrected us, and we gave them reverence. Shall we not much rather be in subjection unto the Father of spirits and live? For they verily for a few days chastened us after their own pleasure, but he for our profit, that we might be partakers of his holiness. Now, no chastening for the present seemeth to be joyous, but grievous. Nevertheless, afterward, it yieldeth the peaceable fruit of righteousness unto them which are exercised thereby. Wherefore, lift up the hands which hang down and the feeble knees, and make straight paths for your feet, lest that which is lame be turned out of the way. But let it rather be healed. All right, now here's why you shouldn't fall out for God's chastening. Number one, God's chastening shows his love. This passage says clearly, Whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. Sometimes we say, Lord, it isn't fair. There's the world and they're prospering, and I'm having a hard time. I'm still sore from that spanking you gave me. You know what that means? That means you're his son. That's he's going to take care of you in ways he ain't going to take That's care of you. That's good. They're in some bad places, and their feet are in some slippery rocks. And he's going to let them fall. He ain't going to let you fall. And he might tan your hide a little bit here and there, and I promise you he will. <laughs> but he's also going to take care of you because you're one of his sons. It says over in uh, Revelation chapter 3, 19, As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. I don't know why, but people have such a hard time with this. In my day, it was self-explanatory. My parents, my grandparents, my uncle, my Christian school teachers, all the people that loved little Bobby occasionally fussed at me and spanked me. <laughs> I knew they loved me. I didn't like it right while I was getting a spanking. I didn't like it right while they was fussing at me. But I knew they loved me. And all the people who never did that couldn't have cared less. <laughs> so that's obvious to me. I knew that when I was six and seven years old. So when I got to be a grown-up and people thought, well, they talk mean to me. They hate me. I thought, no, that's the ones that care about you. I can't wrap my mind around this idea of yelling at somebody shows you don't love them. To me, that shows you do. Amen. If you're not invested in the person, you don't ever yell at them. You couldn't care less what they do. I can't wrap my mind around that. But be that as it may, I do mentally assent to the fact that some people just want to always be taught nice to them. But let me tell you something, folks. There will always be something missing in, the, in your growth if you have to always be taught nice to them. People that love you and care about you and are invested in you and hope the best for you, 
They want to correct you every now and then because they want to see you do good. I don't get it. But let me say this. God's chastening shows his love. All right, second. God's chastening gives happiness and peace. Job 5, the Bible says, happy is the man whom God corrects. You shouldn't fall out when God gives you spanking, when God lets some bad things happen in your life, number one, because that's showing he loves you. You're one of his kids. Number two, because it's the very thing that will bring you happiness and peace. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 11, Now no chastening for the present seemeth to be joyous, but grievous. Nevertheless, afterward, it yieldeth the peaceable fruit of righteousness. How many would like to have the peaceable fruit of righteousness? Amen. All right, here's how you get that. You get whooped. <laughs> you get fussed at. You get told off every now and then. Amen. You know what I do when that happens to me? I get back in the way. <laughs> you know what? I'm used to the fact that I get out of the way sometimes. I'm very comfortable with that. I don't have any problem admitting that. You know who I think has the worst problem getting back in the way when they get fussed at or spanked a little? Somebody who thinks they're right. Now, if you think you're right, I can help you. I hate to say this, but Jesus came to help you. That's his word. Amen. Not mine. Amen. I came not to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. If you're sure you're right, and you're not going to listen to God's chastening and correction or some good follower of the Lord Jesus who is going to have it right most of the time, there's something wrong somewhere. Happy is the man whom God corrects. It yieldeth the peaceable fruit of righteousness. But here's maybe the best thing. God's chastening leads to repentance. Despisest thou the goodness of God and the riches of his goodness and forbearance, not knowing that the goodness of God leadeth thee. God's long suffering. He's put up with you for a long time. I love that old song that the, I think it was the roll-off girls used to sing. You've been running, running for a long, long time. You've been running, running with no peace of mind. You regret the day you turned away and became a fugitive from God. Why don't you turn, turn, turn around? Why do you run? Can't you see God the Father waits to welcome you home? You were never meant to walk the paths you trod. How long will you run away, a fugitive from God? Oh, what good messages in these old hymns and these old songs. God's goodness and God's chastening leads to repentance. Godly sorrow worketh repentance unto salvation, not to be repented of. All right, now let me tell you what's happening. It's fixing to get bad in this world. It's fixing to get bad in this country. Yes. I'm not being a prophet of doom. I'm just looking at the sign. That's right. Economically, we're going to be broke. Our, our fiscal policy is ridiculous. I don't know how much over $30 trillion in debt we are. Would you do business with somebody $30 trillion in debt? There is coming a point that isn't going to work. That's right. Our morals are coming apart. Our family, family, the very basis of society, a husband and wife who have children and love, we can't keep those together. We can't keep anything together. There is no way things are getting better the way they are. So here's what's going to happen. We Bible believe in Baptists. We've been blessed with some things most people don't have. That's true. But there's going to be some opposition. And we're going to get tired of carrying the load. Fall not out, by the way. Here's how you'll fall out. You'll either fall out by quarrel, you'll fall out from a lack of understanding, or you'll fall out due to God's chastening. If you're a backslidden Christian, remember these details can distance you from God just as much as falling into immorality. A lot of times we think, well, if I don't go kill somebody, if I don't go get drunk, if I don't get high on dope, if I don't go fornicate or commit adultery, I'm not backslidden. You can backslide on these things just as easy. And maybe more Baptists do. This is what will get you. Of course, if you're lost, remember that even these subtle traps can keep you from receiving God's Son as your Savior. You get bitter at it and you quit listening to it. That's a tragedy. 
beyond belief. But I tell you what I want. I want you to have the same testimony that we read back here in this in this text that we started with, Genesis chapter 45. I want you to start heading back to the Father. My seed sown is this. I want your heavenly Father to see evidence of your spiritual life. He sees you coming back from him. I want him to say, as Jacob did, my son is yet alive. I will go and see him before I die. Of course, we know God is about to die. But I know this, he wants fellowship with his son. Yes. And if you get back in fellowship with God, all the other problems are fixed. That's right. He'll sustain you. He'll feed you. He'll clothe you. He'll get you through the famine. He'll get take care of your children. He'll take care of your grandchildren. He'll help you get back to the promised land when this famine goes away. He'll take care of everything if you'll get in fellowship with God. And if you're not in fellowship with God, it'll be problem after problem after problem. And you'll be stumbling in the dark and you don't see any light and you're not sure which way to go. And you'll try this and you'll try that and a financial fix and a family fix and a sinful fix and a God knows what fix. It'll all be answered if you'll stay in fellowship with God. Let him say, my son is yet alive. I will go and see him. And the Lord shows up, the problem is over. Fall not out, my Lord. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you for this opportunity to preach your word. I pray, dear God, that we had learned these things.